I've been told to say, what's going on, Queensland? <laughs> um, Dominique, you did a really good job at my last name. Um, I guess it's, you're all waiting for me to pronounce it now. Yeah. <laughs> Such a big mystery to everyone. So it's pronounced Som Pang Si, like so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, first of all, I just really want to thank Dominique for trusting in me and for having me here today. It's a real honor to be part of the Typhism family this year. Um, I found out this time last year, roughly, um, that I'd be speaking. Um, I attended the conference as an audience, and um, yeah, so I've had roughly a full year to panic about this very moment, so that's a good start. Um, while I was preparing for my talk, I kept getting this mental image of myself getting up on stage, getting really nervous, and letting my nerves get the best of me, and clumsily blurting out, Hi, Vanessa, everyone. <laughs> Whoops. Um, so I thought, okay, to celebrate this imaginary mistake that I kept making in my head, I'll just name my talk after it. Um, and the idea for today is that I want to be talking about how making mistakes has actually helped uh, me get to where I am today in my lettering journey. But before we get into all that, I thought I might just speak a little bit about myself and how I got into lettering. So I was born and raised in Bangkok, Thailand. I moved to Melbourne 12 years ago. I was 19. It was a pretty big transition for me. Um, and I've got to thank my siblings for helping me through that. My sister's here, by the way. Um, her name is Huarissa. <laughs> Just to make things confusing, she doesn't look like me. But you know, if you meet someone who's got a name freakishly similar to mine, that's my sister. In 2012, I lodged a visa application, Orissa sponsored me. Um, and after a very long and expensive process, I became an Australian citizen in 2016. Um, <laughs> thank you. I now proudly hold an Australian passport with a very hideous passport photo. <laughs> but um, thanks to my friends, especially the letterettes, um, I know how to express myself like a true Australian. <laughs> so when I initially arrived in Melbourne, I took up an art degree called the Bachelor of Creative Arts, and that's where I met my friend Eliza Svikulis, who's last year's typism speaker and also one of the letterettes. Um, and after I finished my art degree, I felt pretty lost. Of course, it's an art degree. I, of course, I felt confused. Um, and so. I went into graphic design thinking that it'd be easier for me to find a job. And true enough, after I finished my course, I landed myself a job at a web design company. Um, I was making website banners from Monday to Friday, and I got pretty bored pretty fast. So I left in two months. I went into publishing. Um, I started working for a small publishing company called Broker Publishing. And I was working there as a typesetter, a designer. And um, because I was the only one there in the office, I also had to sort of learn to do everything myself. Um, I liaised with the printers, uploaded things to prints, and managed deadlines and things like that. So it was in this typesetting job that I started drawing. Let me tell you a funny story of how it all started. So one day, my ex-boss, Mark, gave me a floppy disk. <laughs> and um, he asked me to look inside <laughs> the floppy disk. And um, I had to explain to him, hey, um, IMAX and floppy disks, that they don't sit well together. And basically, we were making this book about Australian dogs. And I was meant to retrieve some photos of dogs from that floppy disk. I know. Um, <laughs> so I said, yeah, it won't work like that. And he said, OK, how about clip art? <laughs> so I put two and two together. They need photos of dogs. I like drawing. And so I thought, OK, why not give this a go? 
And so I did. <laughs> this is my first published illustration job. Um, the drawings got illustrated, uh, got printed into the internal pages of the book called Australian Dog Stories, published by Broga Publishing. So the first mistake that I made here is that I saw absolutely no value in my skills whatsoever back then. I offered to do these illustrations for free and outside of my working hours. Now this wasn't my boss's fault, it was my own fault for not giving value to my skills. However, the positive reactions that I received from this project made me realize something. It made me realize that maybe my creative skills are sought after. It made me realize that maybe I should push myself further. Um, I feel like this job planted the creative freelancer seed in me because it made me think that maybe, you know, maybe drawing might be a career option for me. So I guess what I want to say here is from the get-go, you should really value your skills. Don't sell yourselves for short and don't underestimate yourselves. Luckily, it was around this time that I joined the Melbourne Lettering Club. Shout out to Bobby High Culture, Bobster14, and um, Tegan and um, Barry for the inspiration. Um, the MLC really encouraged me to keep drawing. I met Kate Poland for the first time at the Lettering Club. I met Maria Montes for the first time. I met Lucky for the first time. I even painted my first mural for the first time with the Lettering Club. So needless to say, the MLC community really provided me with that immense push that I really needed. Um, Luckily, I also shamelessly uploaded my doodles onto Instagram, and honestly, back then, it wasn't even a tactic for me to get work. I was just bored, and I wanted to Instagram. Um, and to my surprise, I started getting job inquiries. There were small inquiries at first. There were you know, wedding invitations from friends and things like that, and then they started to grow into larger scale commercial jobs. By then, I'd reached four years of typesetting. I needed something new, I wanted to challenge myself, and the inquiries kept growing. And so by November 2015, I quit my typesetting job and I've been lettering full time since. So the mistake that I made here is I held myself back for a very long time because of self-doubt. I didn't think that anything I made would be good enough, so by, I guess to fix that, I just wouldn't start anything because I felt like I wasn't ready. Um, and also, coming from a background where English is a second language, I feel that I've had to work a little bit harder just in an English-speaking environment. That's totally understandable. Um, even back when I was applying for graphic design jobs, it was already harder for me to be seen with, intimidating foreign, with such an intimidating foreign name. So how am I going to survive in the freelance world? How am I going to get seen? And Lettering has been a place for me to escape to, and if I turn it into a job, what if I end up hating it? So if you're like me and you're always overthinking, my key tip for you is don't wait until you're ready. Everything is work in progress, so you just have to make a start. In regards to getting started, I guess the next biggest question would be how do you get jobs and how do you find clients? My business grew mainly through three things, Instagram, word of mouth, and networking. And to illustrate my point, I thought I might just show you a few examples of my past work. Um, I feel that each job has its own story, and um, hopefully I'll give you a few tips and tricks here and there. Okay, hands up if you're a Harry Potter fan. Yay! <laughs> cool, I've got my eyes on you guys. We can um, speak at the after party. Let me know what houses you're in. <laughs> um, so roughly over a year ago, I discovered Harry Potter. I know, don't kill me. Um, I'm very late to the party, I know. Um, I'd never read any of the books or seen any of the movies prior to that. But once I started, seriously, no one could stop me. And um, I got very into it. <laughs> um, and of course, I let it about it. So I posted these photos onto Instagram not expecting anything to come out of it, but because I'd hashtagged Harry Potter, a company in the UK called Pottermore.com found me. An email came through one day and it said, Hi, I'm the producer of Pottermore.com. We are the digital heart of J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World. We spotted your work on Instagram and we were wondering if you'd be interested in working with us. 
Of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I was jumping up and down. I was really excited. I was very keen. And that excitement quickly turned into worry, of course. That's my thing, by the way, if you haven't noticed already. I worry a lot. Um, I was thinking, OK, what if I don't get the job? What if they change their minds? What if JK Rowling doesn't like what I make? Uh, <laughs> after all that worrying, everything turned out all right. Um, I created two pieces for them, and they were for Ginny Weasley and for Dumbledore. They got turned into prints and notebooks. So my main tip for you here is to stay visible online. People will remember you, and they'll think of you. So aside from that Harry Potter job, a very similar thing happened to this job. Um, my friend Imogen from the old publishing house that I worked for is now working as a creative director at Text Publishing. We would kept in touch, and she also knows through Instagram that I've been doing lettering. And so she reached out to me with a brief for a children's book called Saving Marty. I was required to come up with a few different type treatments for the cover, and I loved working on this because it was conceptual and it really gave me the opportunity to merge my lettering and my illustration together. I had so much fun, and um, the cover design also went on to being shortlisted for the 2018 Book Design Award. So yeah, stay active online and people will remember you. Next thing I want to talk about is next networking. It's such a big, free, big uh, part of freelancing. Um, I went from sitting alone in an office all day, every day, to all of a sudden being required to turn up to events and gatherings and exhibitions and things like that. Um, honestly, it scared the crap out of me. Um, I'm someone who likes to just sit in her pajamas all day and just knit and drink tea. So, you know, I'm a lot of fun like that. So, <laughs> um, socializing and meeting new people just doesn't come to me naturally. I really had to work hard on it, and I'm glad I did because the cool thing is if you turn up to the same um, sorts of events in the same city with the same pool of people, you you know, strangers become friends, and it's really wonderful because I now really value um, the network of people that I've, I've created who understand what I do and I understand them. It's really wonderful. Speaking of supportive friends, shall we talk about the letterettes? I can see you guys there. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I know Eliza spoke about the letterettes last year, so I'll try and keep things brief, but basically we're four girls. We're Kate Pollan, Carla Hackett, Eliza Svickelis, and myself. And we go around Melbourne doing live lettering, customizing items, we paint murals, we teach workshops, and we work on commercial campaigns. We also work through our agent, the Jackie Winter Group, and I've learned an incredible amount working with the Jackie and Winter Group and through the girls. It's been a really steep learning curve for me. Honestly, when I started working with the letterettes, I felt like a total imposter. I, I really didn't feel like I deserved it. Um, I didn't feel that my totally, I didn't feel that my skills were up to, to scratch, but. Nonetheless, the girls really inspired me to work hard, and they supported me through the days that I felt like I wanted to give up. And up until today, we support each other, but then we also allow room outside of the group to grow our own businesses, and I'm really appreciative of that, so thank you for having me. <laughs> um, next, I want to talk about something that I really, really like doing. And that's creating personal pieces. It's probably why I got into lettering in the first place. Um, it's such a good way to express your thoughts, your passion, or even the courses that you care about. And the cool thing is that you get to build your online folio at the same time. For example, here's a job that I did with the letterettes and Jackie Winter for uh, the launch of Procreate 4 and their new brushes. Um, so you can see by the images down the bottom that those other personal pieces that I made in my own free time, they got referenced and um, the client basically just wanted me to replicate that. So the whole process was so enjoyable and fun for me because I felt so trusted. Another really similar thing happened here with a company based in New York called Nooklin. 
Um, they're basically a real estate agency with a fun and funky approach to their look and brand. So um, the image that says sneakers and tattoos and the illustration of the, the stationery are the images that got referenced. And I basically replic replicated that style. The artwork got installed as murals and window signage in the office in New York. Um, I went straight to Jackie Windsor who helped me with this. So thank you Bianca and Moise for being so lovely to work with. So to restate my point here, I just want to say that you should be creating the kind of work that you want to be hired for. Um, and know that everything you, you, you post online can be used as client reference. You're basically shaping your online folio. Next, I want to talk about style and adaptability. So while there's, where there's something incredibly rewarding about a client coming up to you because they really love your style, I also believe in remaining versatile as a letterer. At the end of the day, we are visual problem solvers. And the more versatile you can stay as a letterer, um, the more challenging you can make things for yourself and you know, keep things interesting for yourself. And also, the more jobs you can take on. So for example, you can experiment with different mediums and different ways to print. Um, here is my collaboration with Bespoke Letterpress. There are birthday cards that got letterpressed in holographic foil. You can also think about the placement of your lettering and where your lettering can go. And as you know, lettering is so popular right now. Um, so we can think of different ways to diversify. I've really worked on this with the letterettes. We've explored so much. We started lettering just on cards. Um, but now our live lettering services expand to um, lettering on sneakers, mugs, luggage tags, phone cases. The list really goes on. Um, for my own personal business in 2016, I applied lettering onto babies' clothing. This wasn't live work. It was commercially printed. But I think it's just really interesting to see lettering expand onto different products. Another really good example of how staying versatile has served me well is this poster that I created recently for Frankie magazine. It's issue 84, and it's just been released, so I think it might still be in the shops. Um, so the image that got referenced um, are the, it's just the image with the vegetables that you can see there. The client wanted me to carry through the line work from the vegetables onto the hands, um, so that was the main thing that I was focused on doing. Um, I'm so glad I paid attention in live drawing class because drawing hands is hard. Um, <laughs> uh, so the client needed someone who can do lettering to cover the A to Z aspect of the poster and also someone who can draw hands. Um, so because I remained versatile, I was able to be that one-stop shop for them. OK. Moving on to everyone's favorite subject, money. This is where it gets really messy. So I've made a lot of notes. And I also feel that I'm still learning so much about this process. I've learned so much from the girls, the letterettes, and um, the Jack and Winter group. But if I miss anything out, or if any of you guys feel that you have any suggestions for me, please come and speak to me after the show. I'd really appreciate any feedback. Here are some things I've learned so far about money management tips. You've got to be good at saving because cash flow will be so unpredictable. It's wise to have a stable go-to client. I personally still do a little bit of graphic design work here and there for a client that I've worked for for five years. Um, the money that I make from them probably makes up 10% of my current income right now, but it just gives me that little peace of mind that, you know, if I hit a slow period in, in my jobs, I'm still safe. Um, it's wise to hire an accountant to make sure that you are making the most of your finances. You'd also want to keep track of your income and your expenses. I enter my income and expenses into a spreadsheet, probably weekly or biweekly. 
pay your own super. Now, I'm not really sure about this one anymore because I've heard mixed feedback. I've been told by my accountant that I need to pay my own super, but yeah, speak to your accountant. <laughs> That's why I'm not an accountant, right? <laughs> um, okay, and then lastly, the, the easiest thing you can do is keep your receipts. Okay, pricing tips. When it comes to quoting for jobs, it's on you to get as much information as you can from your client so that you can quote for your job properly. I usually um, go by hourly rate, times creation time, but that being said, you can't always, um, you can't always quote by hour. You just have to kind of see. Um, I went from a very low $18 per hour fresh off uni graphic design rate to then going on to quoting just 25 hours, sorry, 25, 25 hours? $25 per hour um, for my live lettering uh, job in 2015. I currently go by a minimum of $100 to $120 per hour for my live lettering, and I'm, I'm expecting that to keep growing as I go along. You also want to think about usage and licensing, um, how and where your artwork will appear. Is it online? Is it print? If it's printed, does the client hold the rights to then go and reprint that if your product sells well? Um, also, don't forget to factor in material costs or travel costs if there are any. How many rounds of corrections are you allowing if you're charging by project? How much are you going to charge after the rounds of corrections end? Will you charge them a rush fee if the deadline is tight? So no one walks into a bakery and asks for free bread, right? Why should people expect creatives to work for free? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yay. Um, no one goes to see a doctor and goes like, oh, well, that took you 10 minutes. Can I just get that for free? So I stand for creatives being paid for their hard work, and I know it's been a hard and long journey for me, and I know that many of you in this room experience the same thing. I think it's a matter of educating our clients and keeping the standards high in our industry, but at the same time, I also think that it's a great idea to do pro bono work for the core sets that you care about. At the end of the day, we're visual communicators, and we hold that power to get the message out there. Okay, I'm glad that's done. <laughs> The money thing is done. <laughs> oh. Okay, let's talk about something a bit easier, um, work-life balance. I love my self-employed life. I love the freedom that comes with it. Um, I really love being able to take time in the mornings and have big breakfasts. It's the best. Um, the challenging thing is this. I find it really hard to switch off. I also work from home, so it's sometimes hard to separate my work life from my personal life. So um, I have to make sure that I have time off my phone. Um, I try and mix things up a little bit, so I sometimes go out to cafes or libraries or meet friends and bounce ideas off them and things like that. Um, I also really, really love yoga, so I prioritize that. For me, back pain and lettering just they come hand in hand, so <laughs> yoga really fixes that for me, and it's a form of meditation and a workout combined. It's, it's perfect, I love it. So I really encourage you to find something that you like outside work to do and, and um, look after yourselves. Don't overwork yourself. Have time for your relationships and stay healthy. Pretty basic advice, but yeah, I've been there. <laughs> um, I also want to talk to you guys about valuing your progress. Most of the time, especially in this Instagram world that we live in now, um, people just see the end product of the things that you're working on. They don't really get to see the behind the scenes. So I want to show you something, and I hope you're ready for it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is what my lettering looked like when I started lettering in 2013. Uh, my friend Nancy, who's also in this room right now, kept that card that I made for her, and it's dated June 2013, so thanks, Nancy. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, if you look back at your old work and it gives you goosebumps or if you want to vomit a little, I think that's pretty normal. If anything, that's really, really good because um, it shows that you've, you've come a long way and that you've worked hard. And the key to getting better at anything is just practice. So I hope that this is a good reminder for you guys to keep going and to keep practicing. Um, before you stare at this for too long, let me wrap this up. I want to share with you one last story about my family. My grandparents are refugees of the Second World War. They migrated from China, fleeing from the war, and they arrived in Bangkok empty-handed. My grandpa from my dad's side of the family worked a labor job. He loaded and unloaded stock onto boats carrying products like rice and sugar. So after saving up enough money, he opened up a convenience store. Things didn't really get easier after that, and my dad moved around quite a lot, just following wherever granddad's business went. My grandpa from my mom's side of the family, who, by the way, passed away at a glorious 97 years old, spent his young years as a tailor. Here's the thing, though, he started his tailoring job with zero tailoring skills. And he learned on the job as he went. Eventually, he opened up his own tailoring shop, and that's how he provided for his family. So for my grandparents, it was all about survival. They didn't necessarily have a choice. So I feel really lucky to be born into a setting where everything is already provided for me. I feel really privileged to live a life of choice and to be able to follow my passion. And I'm forever grateful for all the hard work that my parents put into getting me here today. So when I was a graphic designer, I wasn't really happy with what I was doing. There was a certain amount of time where I felt, okay, yeah, this is not bad. Um, but I knew that I liked drawing, and I knew that I wanted to do something that I love for work. And I look back at my ancestors and how hard they've worked to get me here. Um, because I have that privilege of choice, I will not let that choice go to waste. The generations before me have shown me how it's good to fail every now and then because we learn so much through making mistakes. Failing is part of the process. Don't judge yourselves too hard when you fail. We're our own worst judges, and when things get tough, just remember why you started. Thank you for having me.